Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, senior members, especially those on the platform, our special invited guests, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Today is a very great day for us here at the University of Ghana. Inaugural lectures are part of the University of Ghana academic calendar. But by way of information, inaugural lectures are normally are delivered by full professors, professors who have attained full professorship and who have reached the pinnacle of their academic career. By our statutes, they are supposed to deliver inaugural lectures which make their professorship complete. So today we welcome Professor Akusi Adumakuampofu. May I on this note welcome the Vice Chancellor, Professor Ernest Aite, to proceed with the introduction of the lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Amua. Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs, Provosts, Deans, Directors, Heads of Departments, former Vice Chancellors, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very pleased on this occasion, once again, to introduce one of our own, delivering an inaugural lecture. It is particularly pleasing for this university to have an inaugural lecture. This is the first for the calendar year and the first out of three that have been planned for the next few months. As Mrs. Amua said, we do require of uh, professors that they deliver these inaugural lectures. The inaugural lectures are intended to present to the world the achievements of the professor. They are intended to show the world that the professor has worked diligently on a theme or themes that he or she would like to share with the rest of the world and show the consistency and the quality of their work. So we, as academics, take a lot of pride in being able to deliver inaugural lectures. There may be some people who pro retire as professors without ever delivering an inaugural lecture. But we often insist that if you are truly a professor, you deliver one. So today, we've come to listen to Professor Akusuya Adumaku Ampof, where she's going to show the world why she's a professor. I first met her, she wasn't looking at gender or social issues. She was looking at houses. When I first met her, she was studying architecture, and then later on moved into development planning, and then from development planning moved into sociology before finally settling on gender studies. Professor Akusia Adamakwampofu teaches one of the university's five required undergraduate courses, that is Introduction to African Studies. Her graduate teaching and research focus on knowledge systems reproductive health and sexualities, identity politics, gender-based violence, women's work, masculinities, and women in popular culture. In 2007, she delivered the Emily Manford Distinguished Lecture in Medical Sociology at the University of Tulsa. In 2008, she was a member of the Presidential Panel on Human Rights in Africa at the annual meetings of the American Sociological Association in San Francisco. In 2010, she was a guest of the Council of Culture in Egypt. Professor Adumaku Ampofu has over 60 publications, including six edited collections, 22 journal articles, 24 referee chapters, 10 working papers, reviews and conference proceedings. She also has produced several 
technical reports. And with Awa Siedu, has one creative musical production on DVD. Professor Adumako Ampofu has received numerous grants and awards for her work, including from Cordestria, the Population Council, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, UNFPA, UNIFEL, the West African Research Council, and WHO. She has been a junior Fulbright scholar, a recipient of a Rockefeller Bellagio team residency, and in 2004, was a Fulbright New Century Scholar. In 2010, Professor Adama Kwampofu was awarded the American Sociological Association's Sociologists for Women in Society Feminist Activism Award. As an activist scholar, Professor Adama Kwampofu has been, or is, a member of many professional and civil society organizations, such as the Association of African Women for Research and Development, based in Dakar, the African Studies Association, as well as two of the ASS cognate organizations, namely the Women's Caucus of the African Studies Association, of which she was the first and so far only Africa-based co-convener, and the Ghana Studies Association. The Gender and Women's Studies for Africa Network, the International Sociologists Association, of which she is co-president-elect, together with Professor Josephine Beoku betz of the Research Committee on Women in Society. The Network for Women's Rights in Ghana, NetRight, the Ghana Domestic Violence Coalition, and Sociologists for Women in Society. She serves on the boards of journals such as Culture, Societies, and Masculinities, Feminist Africa, and Gender and Society, and is currently co-editor with Stefan Misha of the University of California, Santa Barbara, of Ghana Studies, published by the University of Wisconsin Press. Professor Adumako Ampofu serves on many scientific committees and review panels and is an advisory board member of the African Humanities Fellowship Program and the Next Generation Social Sciences in Africa Fellowship Program. She is a member of the African Gender Evaluators Network and has consulted for national and international organizations, including the ARC Foundation, Association of African Universities, Ghana Family Planning Program, Ghana Statistical Service, Ministry of Health, Ghana, Save the Children, Johns Hopkins University, UNAIDS, UNFPA, UNICEF, and WHO. Her civic contributions are reflected in current and previous membership of boards such as the Ghana AIDS Commission, Action Aid Ghana, the Christian Rural Aid Network, and the Ghana Institute of Linguistics, Literacy, and Bible Translation, where she is vice chair and serves as a University of Ghana institutional representative. She also frequently speaks at youth, gender, and development issues in the media. Professor Adumako Ampofu loves to swim, dance, paint, read, mainly biographies, autobiographies, and African-centered novels, and watch drama movies. Not the Nigerian type, I guess. Together with her life partner, Dr. Kwame Ampofu, they have two daughters, Ya Parebia Ampofu, a freshman at Yale, and Akusia Asamwabia Ampofu, a student of the Roman Rick School in Accra. Her inspiration for living comes from her Christian faith, and she worships at Calvary Baptist Church in Teshinungwa, where she is a church council member and marriage counselor. So, from what I've read, it's evident that uh, this is a woman who knows a lot about the driver and the meat, gender politics in Africa, and social transformation. We will listen to her in a minute. All I knew about drivers and mates, what, what I learned uh, at Collegon. You know, there are these trotro 
vehicles that move from Mamprobi to a post office and stop at Kolebu Mobile. That's how I know drivers and mates. The driver is sitting in front and the mates at the back. I've struggled since I was given the title to see the connection between drivers and mates and gender development, transformation, politics. I guess this is the time for us, for me to find out exactly what the connection between the aplanke and the driver is. So today we will find out. Without any further ado, let me present to you Professor Akosia Adumako Ampo. Vice-Chancellor Professor Ernest Aite, Pro-Vice-Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs Professor Kweku Asam, Deans and Directors, and I see some of the former directors of the Institute here, Professor J. Chinkitia, and I have seen Professor George Hagen um, also in the audience. Former Vice-Chancellors, I see Aki and Prof. Tegu and Prof. Adahemensa. I don't know if um, Prof. Bene is here, but thank you all very much for coming. I'm deeply um, gratified. My colleagues, senior and junior, members of the diplomatic corps, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, thank you all for coming. Many have sent calls, texts, emails, and good wishes. And I'm sure they knew how nervous I am this evening and that I needed such encouragement. Mr. Chairman, today is an auspicious day in our nation's history. Exactly 65 years ago, three World War II veterans who had fought with the Gold Coast Regiment of the Royal West African Frontier Force, namely Sergeant Ajete, Corporal Atipo, and Private Odate Lamte, were killed by the British colonial government. Their crime, organizing a peaceful demonstration to petition the governor for their rights, namely their end of war benefits and pay. It is a privilege to speak about issues related to our well-being on this date and in their memory. Although I've been lecturing for over 23 years to diverse audiences at home and abroad, delivering this evening's lecture, I think, is the pinnacle for me, and you will understand why I'm a little bit nervous. Ours is a profession in which we are trained to find gaps in the works of others, indicate how we are addressing these, and how we are extending the discipline. And this evening too, as the Vice Chancellor has said, I must answer. Living in African urban spaces, there's no ignoring the ubiquitous trotro, 
also variously known as Kiakia in Benin and Togo, Kombi in Botswana and South Africa, Tankatanka in the Gambia, and of course, Matatu in Kenya and Uganda, to name but a few. If you have never had the pleasure of riding in one, perhaps you have watched the entertaining Ghanaian sitcom Trotro, Choco Trotro. Whether you have personally experienced or enjoyed being in a Trotro, you will know that power is not as clearly distributed as the driver being superordinate and the mate being subordinate. The mate has interesting ways of subverting the driver. And while typically male, the mate is also feminized, particularly by passengers who often question his manhood by failing to give him the respect due a man and speaking to him as if he were a boy. But the mate has the power to assign you to a bad seat or to fail to give you the correct change or to ask the driver to leave you far from your spot. So it is with politics of gender in Africa. Interesting, complex, but also troubling sometimes. But driver and mates must collaborate for the transportation sector to survive, and so must the genders. The sub subject of gender, like race, ethnicity, religion, and politics, typically produces strong emotions. Some of you this evening are bound to disagree with some of my observations. And indeed, on Monday of this week, in a conversation with my mother, I did not have an easy time trying to persuade her on a particular issue of domestic work. But that is the way of scientific discourse. We engage, and I hope you will give some consideration to my musings this evening. Now some acknowledgments. It may be true that by the time you attain professorship, you have indeed done work that deserves sharing via an inaugural. I sincerely hope so. However, I know that if today I have anything worthy to share, then there are so many people who have contributed, and it would be impossible to mention everyone. I'm fully persuaded, however, that my professional journey has been traveled on the wings of grace. The scripture says, it is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. And that should take the arrogance out of our earthly achievements. God works through humans. To progress in the academy, you must love learning. And my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph and Hannah Dumako, instilled this in us from infancy. And I would like to publicly acknowledge them today. When I graduated from UST, with a Bachelor of Science in Architecture in 1982, my father handed me a file that contained every single report card, school letter, and receipt from KG to university. The early records reveal comments such as, she talks too much. She does well, but is untidy. One teacher notes that my compositions were good, but marred by many spelling mistakes. My parents persisted. My mother read to us constantly, and in class three, gave me books as rewards to encourage me to learn my times tables. My parents made me believe I could achieve anything and encouraged my choices. They were also examples for social transformation, speaking against injustice and advocating for the right thing to be done, even when the system said it could not, and it made them unpopular. Mommy, Daddy, thank you. My siblings were good students, and my elder sister, Tina, set a standard. When I improved her O-level aggregate by one point, I knew I had done well. <laughs> my late father-in-law, Professor D.A. Ampofu, though he passed away within a year of my marriage, was an inspiration for one, how one could be a caring academic. As for my mother-in-law, Mrs. Ampofu, a.k.a. Auntie Mimi, a.k.a. Mama, she and her sister, Antia Mwakwa, were ever available other mothers for my daughters. I have also benefited from Mama's kitchen and her prayers. Mama, thank you very much. If you need an instrument to keep you from taking yourself too seriously and for a reality check, then find a teenager. 
from my clothes, through the content of my talks, to exhortations to me to practice what I preach, I receive honest criticism from my daughters. During one of my talks, Akosuya, my younger daughter, who was sitting next to me, passed me a note saying, and I quote, it is getting boring, stop talking and let them ask questions. <laughs> I obeyed and saved my reputation. Akosuya, I hope you will not find me boring today. But it has also meant that their praise is sincere. Both Yao Paribia and Akosuya Samwabia love learning. They are great fun to be with, and I am grateful to God for their lives. At the risk of embarrassing Akosuya, she is the author of the photograph on my banner advertising this inaugural, as well as some of the photos in this presentation. And in these days of doom so when sitting at home to write in a sustained manner has been very difficult. On occasion, I relied on Yao Paribia in far away New Haven for some of my data and references. Thank you, girls. <laughs> Dr. Kwame Ampo for AKA Tibbs, who has traveled with me for nigh 21 years, thereabouts, I think. The journey would have been so much more tedious and definitely a lot less fun without him. Although no expert, excuse me, on gender theory, his actions show a depth of commitment to gender justice that will put many feminists to shame. Sometimes we women joke that behind every successful woman is another woman, her mother, her sister, her house help, her daughter, herself. <laughs> and there have been indeed many strong and stalwart women who have supported me, like my mother and mother-in-law. However, there's no way I would have gotten this far without my husband's practical help and support. He said that if professor was the pinnacle of my career, then it was for professorship I must aim. He has also edited this lecture to make sure that I don't keep you here until 9 p.m. <laughs> Thanks, Tibbs, I owe you for life. In Ibri Girls, we learned to work hard, and as an adult, I've come to appreciate much of the discipline we endured. To my dear headmistress, present here today, Auntie Joyce, thank you very much. I'm totally delighted too that my 1976 year group, as well as current students and the headmistress, Mrs. Bempo, are here this evening. Girls, those were sweet years. Bepo Sohain. Although I veered from architecture, the influence of some of, some of my lecturers has remained. One such is Henry Nee Adri Wellington, professor of architecture, an example of generous, committed, godly direction. Prof. Aiko. My UST colleagues, especially members of Abandoned Life Ministry, the bonds of fellowship we built have sustained me to this day. I'm also grateful to my pastor, Reverend Oliver Digby, for his support and prayers and the support of our church. <clears throat> Prof. Tego, I hope you've seen yourself in this slide. My career as an academic has been nurtured at the University of Ghana. Through lean years, challenging moments, as well as bright days. And I appreciate this space called the University of Ghana. Uh, VC, I hope you've also seen yourself. It would be impossible to mention all those who have supported, challenged, laughed, and cried with me. But I must pay particular tribute to Professor Bene, at the time Pro Vice Chancellor, and Ahin, then Director of the Institute of African Studies, for encouraging me to join the university. Professor Techua Menu was the first colleague I worked with, and together we institutionalized gender studies at the Institute. Professor Christina Pong suggested some of my early research directions, and I'm grateful for the support of the Institute's fellows, staff, and students, especially Ms. Adote, the Admin Administrative Secretary, and Dr. Kwame Amwalabi, the Deputy Director, my secretarial staff, Florence and Sheila, and Mr. Samwa, my driver. We are a lot of people at the Institute. I could by no means mention everyone's name. Of my many teaching and research companions, I would like to acknowledge colleagues at Sejensa and mention Professors Georgi Chikata, Mansa Pra, Drs. Michael Ochrefu, Akosia Dakwa, and Nana Ekuya Anidoho, with whom I have worked a lot in recent years. My five member PhD committee at Vanderbilt Francis Dodu, who was the chair, Karen Campbell, George Becker the late Felix Boating and Ronnie Steinberg. They really pushed me. And I'm especially indebted to Francis, my friend and colleague, who was 
the Adwat chair of my committee. In the early 1990s, when I was unknown and nobody wanted or would give research funding to somebody whose reputation they were uncertain of, I literally walked from door to door looking for funding for my work on adolescent sexualities. One woman saw something she thought worth investing in, Dr. Charlotte Gardner, then at the Ministry of Health, and I remain grateful for her confidence. I must also acknowledge two special colleagues who first mentored me and with whom I shared writing projects, associational membership, and warm welcomes into their homes. Josephine Bioku Betts, Professor of Sociology and Director of Women's Studies at Florida Atlantic University, and Mary Osirim, also Professor of Sociology and Dean of Graduate Studies at Bryn Mawr College. As a scholar activist, collectives are important. Netright, the DV Coalition, Sociologists for Women in Society, Gender and Women's Studies Network, the ARC Foundation, WISE, I thank all of you. I'm also indebted to my long-term girlfriends in God, here at home and abroad. Penyin, Teria, Sylvia, Abna, Joyce, Elizabeth, Awo, Adwa, God bless you, sisters. And finally, my graduate assistants, my TAs, my team, FESPA. I have learned a great deal from the insights of my many graduate students over the years. Some later became my colleagues. And last, but certainly not least, in preparation for the exhibition of my works at Baum Library and for this lecture, the team, the A team, Abnachre, Mamichre, Wabrobe, Esi Osam, and Principal ICT Assistant Echo and Siwa Arthur have been amazing. Mr. Chairman, at a time when many people cannot be relied upon, they have given me hope that our nation may yet have a future. My lecture is divided into four parts. For the curious and urged on by my sister in arms on council, Professor Esther Sechi Dawson, I will explain briefly how I came to examine gender issues instead of designing buildings. In the second part, I respond to the question, do Africans do gender? Address the concept, its history, contestations, and contributions of African gender studies to the humanities. In the third section, I comment on some issues I have engaged with, namely reproductive health and sexualities, gender identities, popular culture, and masculinities. I will pay a bit more attention to this area because it's still young in African gender scholarship. And I will conclude with some ideas on social transformation. I hope I can convey to you the value of an African-centered approach to knowledge production. From architecture to the academy. The importance of self-location in scientific inquiry is one of the contributions of gender scholarship. In as much as we try to be objective, science is non-neutral. What we decide to study, how we do this, the questions we ask, and how we read the answers are influenced by our worldviews. So I will locate myself in relation to my work. Four strands of my identity bear referencing. Being an Africanist, a leftist, a feminist, and a Christian. Since there can be confusion about what these terms mean, let me explain the sense in which I use them. An Africanist, simply put, is a person who specializes in the cultures of Africa and privileges an African worldview. A leftist, this is a person on the political left, supportive of social equality and the state's role in ensuring this. I think it is unacceptable for the state to allow unbridled, obscene accumulation and consumption by a few individuals and corporations while neglecting the needs of most, especially the most vulnerable. A feminist is a person who advocates for social, political, and other rights for women equal to those of men, and men too can be feminists. A Christian is a person who has a relationship with Jesus Christ and seeks to exhibit a spirit and live a life that is in concert with such a relationship. These strands of my identity do not find an easy marriage. Some Christians are at best suspicious, at worst they insist a feminist cannot be a Christian. Unless they are liberation theologists, Christians are often suspicious of leftists. Africanists and leftists are often suspicious of Christians. A staunch and chromized, my late paternal grandfather escaped three assassination attempts for his rejection of the Matemehu movement. 
Yet, as a young adult, I was disillusioned with the seeming hypocrisy of both socialism and Christianity. The socialists were too quick to grab worldly comforts the minute they found opportunity. And as for Christians, were these not the people who condemned fornication, adultery, and homosexuality only for one to discover these were the very practices they succumbed to? Feminism, as I understood it, was distant, Eurocentric, and angry. In exploring historical sources, biblical translations, and with personal encounters, I discovered the real Jesus Christ, not the one reflected by human beings. This was delightful because Christ's level of social consciousness and gender sensitivity is amazing. There are several examples of Christ's counterculture when it comes to his relationship with women. He associated with women at a time when Jewish tradition frowned on women studying with rabbis. Jewish thinking at the time generally viewed women as the cause of men's sexual sins. And so to prevent Jewish men from yielding to temptation, they were instructed not to speak to women in public, including their own wives. Jesus did the contrary and even touched and allowed himself to be touched in public by women. Jesus Christ emerged as someone who identified strongly with social justice, reflected in the scripture that reads, now there is no Jew nor Greek, female or male, slave or free. This discovery was also scary because it required a personal response. Mr. Chairman, this personal preface is important because I believe that scientific inquiry should be linked to the Christ kind of social justice. So while the study of architecture in the 1970s and 80s certainly included the study of societies and cultures, it was not until fate opened doors for alternative study that I recognized my poor fit with this rather technical profession. In 1981, when I was in my first year of postgraduate architectural study at the University of Science and Technology, the universities in Ghana were closed for one year following months of struggle by students expressing their dissatisfaction with the then military PNDC regime. Eventually, I got frustrated and joined my elder sister in Germany and ended up studying development planning, became deeply interested in the broader issues of development and abandoned architecture. There is no shortage of development issues to explore, and so perhaps it was mere serendipity that I found gender, or perhaps it found me. Perhaps the statistics and stories on women's situation propelled me down the path I have since traveled. I must warn you that some of the images, not necessarily pictures, are disturbing as you listen. Let us start with some of the regular statistics um, that we hear. Though my selections are by sex, the impacts are not merely or even primarily biological, but rather cultural. In other words, it is not the mere fact of being a woman that makes one die in childbirth. Pregnancy is not a deadly disease. Nor is it the mere fact of being a man that makes one experience a higher risk of being killed or abused in conflict. The world's highest rape statistics can be found in Botswana, 92.9 per 100,000 per capita. The lowest also in Africa, we are told in Egypt, but we know that some statistics are hidden. As a comparison, the rate in Ghana is 6.85 per 100,000 per capita. Maternal mortality, that's a big one. In South Sudan, 2,054 women die per 100,000 live births. So just imagine, you have 100,000 women 2,000 of them will die. The lowest rate is in Estonia, where the figure is two per 100,000. Mauritius has the lowest figure in Africa, 60 per 100,000 live births. And Ghana is not doing very well after so many years with about 350 per 100,000 live births. Women in parliament, Rwanda has 56.3, Yemen, only 0 0.3, Egypt, 2, and Ghana, I'm not sure exactly, but we're hovering around 10%. Female teachers in tertiary education, Chad, 3.7, 
Lesotho 47.5, Ghana 17.4. With maternal mortality, which has become a very topical issue recently, the paradox and scandal is that as infant mortality declines and more children survive beyond the age of five, mothers are still dying in childbirth. It's preventable and much has to do with the poor or inaccessible health care. Why should there only be one or two doctors in a regional hospital? What miracles should they perform? Deaths occur, and we say it is God's will. And since God has not protested, we continue to blame him. <laughs> since the recent conflict in Mali, more women are being abused, forced into marriages, husbands are reselling their wives, fundamentalists, are stoning couples for adultery. Recently, a woman, a mother of two, has been buried up to her waist in a hole before a group of men pelted her to death with rocks. And in October, the Islamists in Mali began compiling lists of unmarried mothers so that they could begin to deal with them. Tahrir Square, that site of resistance, has also become a site for serious abuses of women as sexual abuse seems to be growing in Egypt. Testimonies reveal that women who have gone to the square to demonstrate and protest have been stripped of their clothes and hijabs. They have been grabbed, beaten, groped, vaginally penetrated with fingers, sticks, and other objects. Here is one story, a collage of several testimonies. On Friday, 23rd November 2012, at 6.30 p.m., I went with a friend to express our rejection of the distorted constitution among the millions that took to the streets for the same purpose. We were on the corner of Mohammed Mahmoud Square Street, the Martyr Street, and the Eyes of Freedom Street. They stripped me of my nationality and my sense of belonging. Before I knew it, I was thrown up against a wall where a motorcycle was parked. I was standing on top of the bike while my friend and a few other men tried to make a half circle to protect me. But there were more men trying to hurt me than protect me, and I was grabbed all over, and my pants and shirt were ripped. In that moment, it was as if the men got even more crazy. My pants were pulled down by the many men, and they ripped me with their dirty fingers. I managed to pull my pants up again, and I could still see the face of my friend trying with all his power to keep at least some of the men away. I really saw the best and worst of men. Suddenly, we were pushed onto the sidewalk, and then the men attacked. At first, they formed a human chain, trying to protect me, but the other men were grabbing every inch of my body through the shield, grabbing at everything. I was screaming, jumping, trying to get the hands off me. Suddenly, they saw other women and left me. But women are not the only victims of violence. Men's experience of rape in Central Africa is horrendous. Sexual violence is one of the most horrific weapons of war, an instrument of terror typically used against women, but male rape is endemic in that part of the continent. Makarere University's Refugee Law Project helps displaced people work through their traumas. One case was a puzzle to them. A female client was having marital difficulties. My husband can't have sex, she complained to her counselor. He feels very bad about this. I'm sure there's something he's keeping from me. The husband was invited, but no progress was made until the, the counselor asked the wife to leave. The man then murmured cryptically, it happened to me. The counselor frowned. He reached into his pocket, this is the man, and pulled out an old sanitary pad. Mama Eunice, he said, I am in pain. I have to use this. Laying the pus-covered pad on the desk in front of him, he gave up his secret. During his escape from the civil war in neighboring Congo, he had been separated from his wife and taken by the rebels. His captors raped him three times a day, every day, for three years. And he wasn't the only one. He watched as man after man was taken and raped. The rape of men is an attempt to completely emasculate them. It is not about sexuality. It is about violence and conquest. The level of violence, especially gender-based and sexual violence in a society, is a barometer of our democracy. The more violent a society, the more sexual violence is tolerated. 
and the more likely that human rights will be abused and vice versa, and the majority of citizens will suffer. There is a good reason to fight against this. In this second section, I address the concept of gender, its history, focus, and contestations. Isn't gender about women and men, people ask. Implicit therein lies an accusation, as in, if gender is about women and men, then why do we only hear about women? This is often followed by, what crowd do you women want? And being called a gender activist is not necessarily a compliment. Some argue that traditionally, African men and women had a peaceful and complementary existence, and that gender advocacy is a foreign invention that has been adopted by disgruntled African women who cannot sustain healthy relationships with men. Indeed, gender is about women and men. And yes, African societies had creative ways of sustaining themselves that included the complementarity of the sexes. Indeed, in her award-winning book, Invention of Women, Making an African Sense of Western Gender Discourses, 1997, Oye Ronke Oye a Nigerian sociologist based in the US, argues that gender is an invention of Western feminists and that Yorubas, and by extension, Africans, don't do gender. The Yoruba language, so her argument goes, is gender neutral, and Yoruba society is ordered along lines of seniority, not gender, such that it is the person marrying into a family who becomes a junior, irrespective of their sex. What Oyeumi does not address, and for which African-based scholars have critiqued her, is the fact that the absence of a gender-specific language does not remove gender from our reality. So for example, the Akan word or hene does not mean a woman had equal access to chieftaincy as a man. Oyewumi also fails to acknowledge that among the Yoruba who are patrilineal, it is always the women who marry in. So it is the women who become the juniors. In any case, if seniority held more salience in African societies a few hundred years ago, this does not mean that gender is not salient today. And there are two undeniable facts. One, even among African societies guarded by what Kwame Ayan has noted as marked dural equality, men as a group generally had more rights and privileges than women, while many of women's rights and the enjoyment of certain privileges were tied to their relationships with men as fathers, husbands, brothers, and so forth. Or, as we shall soon see, the women themselves could become men. Number two, today, for good or ill, Western ideas and practices have been introduced into our societies by education, the media, multinational corporations, donor agencies, and national governments. They affect gender relations in Africa both positively and negatively, and they cannot be ignored. Whilst almost everyone is born with a particular sex and we are either female or male, we are not born with our gender, we learn it. We can say therefore that females and males are born, but women and men are made. We generally determine that someone is female or male if he or she behaves in a manner that society considers to be feminine or masculine. It is these social and local understandings of gender that determine the appropriate roles and behaviors for women, men, boys, and girls. It should thus be clear that these will differ across the world and even among different societies in Africa. Nor are they fixed in time, but rather they can change over the life course. And I will use two examples to illustrate that gender is not necessarily equal to sex. The first is about male daughters female husbands, and the second is about men who become women. The concept of female husbands or male daughters, a term popularized by Ife Amadume, a prominent Nigerian scholar, describes African societies where in the absence of male heirs, biological females, typically the eldest daughter, were allowed to become sons. They would marry other women, inherit the property and titles of sons, and thus become de jure sons. This institution of social marriage between two women, one of them now a female husband, has been recorded among more than 30 societies throughout Africa, including the Igbo of Nigeria, the Igikuyu, Akamba, and Nandi of what is now modern Kenya, the Nuer of Sudan, 
and the Luvdu of South Africa. The female husbands were not expected to dress or behave like men. Rather, the practice centered around procreation. Essentially, the female husband married another woman by paying the usual bride wealth for her and then selected a suitable male janitor to father children for her, who in some cases, like among the Nua, referred to her as father. Among the Nua as well, if the wife had sexual relations with a man the female husband had not approved of, she could demand damages from the offending man. But it is not everyone, even within that paradigm, who agrees, and there are contestations. Gender scholarship in Africa has had controversy about a name. How do we name concepts? What does gender mean? Some have identified as feminists, some as gender scholars, some say they are womanists, some reject certain terms that have come from Europe, some are more political, some are less political. But despite these disagreements, there is agreement that many things need to be done to improve the terrain. Also problematized in African gender scholarship are the high profile national programs launched by its first ladies in the 1980s, such as those launched by the wives of Rawlings in Ghana and Babangida of Nigeria to improve the lives of rural and marginalized women. African gender scholars have viewed these as the governmental appropriation of gender for agendas that have very little to do with the liberation of African women and were more about politics. African gender studies have addressed some conceptual and methodological flaws associated with the studies of families and societies, and I will limit myself to three. The household. Until recently, in census and survey data, the household was conceptually and methodologically interpreted as income pooling, co-residential, joint unit of production and consumption, within which the reproduction of human labor or the individual is assured through the consumption of collective goods. Conceptually, it constituted a head of household, a male, a wife, and children, with a man viewed as the sole provider. Income pooling, co-residential, does this even reflect much of our society today? How many families do not live in two places? How many women pool their resources with their husbands? I will point to just two of the challenges with that, that definition of the household. One, many men have more than one wife, thus complicating this notion of a household. And two, in matrilineages especially, but also other lineage groups, women are primarily responsible for food production. Across Africa, women have assumed major responsibility for subsistence. And even if they don't own land, they have access to it, and they make sure that their households are food sufficient. In South Malawi, for example, which is matrilineal, like much of Ghana, the main food crop is maize. A study found that especially where husbands were absent, more prosperous sisters shared grain with their less well-off ones. In some cases, sisters or other maternal relatives ate together. Each woman cooks her family's food and brings it to one of the other homes, and the meal is shared. Husbands and children are served separately, and this is not considered as food sharing. Responding to this situation among the Igbo of Nigeria, Ekejuba produced the more useful and gender-sensitive term, hearthhold, to replace household, which she defines as demographically made up of a woman and all her dependents, whose food security she is either fully or partially responsible for, unquote. I'm sure for many of us, when we think of our grandmothers, this resonates. The male head of household in this scenario has his own land, labor, etc., and he may contribute to, but is never solely responsible for, the total expenditure of the household. In polygynous situations, he is assured of periodic access to food, labor, and sexual services from the various households of which he forms a part. Thus, it becomes a unit of consumption and production, which depends in part on transfers from other households and whose function also includes socializing the next generation. The relationship between households, that is wives, co-wives, mothers-in-law, etc., is marked by both solidarity and conflict, as there is competition over the male spouse's contributions. This work has been taken into the census and survey work um, over the years, and I think gender scholars can be uh, given credit that these days we measure households in a more complex and correct manner. And we talk about people who eat from a common pot. The second concept is the public-private. 
Western literature points to a dichotomy between the public space and the private space, with men located in the public where politics and business occurs, and women in the latter where domestic activities occur. The explanation has been that women's reproductive roles make them naturally predisposed to taking care of the domestic space. In other words, their biology or their sex, rather than culture, has been used to explain the fact that women remain in the private space, so-called the domestic space. While this separation existed to some extent prior to colonialism, the latter reinforced and consolidated it. Prior to colonialism, women combined domestic and commercial work, subsistence and exchange farming. Prior to colonialism, land was communally owned. Western ideology provided for individual title to land, mainly to men, employed men in public services, recognized only male chiefs, introduced the housewife, created the artificial dichotomy between public and private, and made domestic work invisible. African gender studies show how the public-private dichotomy is unrealistic, inaccurate, and never really reflected the African experience, if indeed it reflected the European one. Third concept, making women's work visible. African gender scholarship has also contributed to making women's work, especially so-called domestic work, visible. Until the 1990s, domestic work was neither recognized nor counted as work. And even today, it remains invisible to the extent that many a housewife will say, oh no, I don't really work, I am only a housewife. And yet, the work of cooking, cleaning, laundry, childcare, and so forth is crucial for the survival of our societies and should be valued and appreciated. It is also work that has a real cost, even if it is unpaid. The joke is told of a family who had employed a domestic worker to clean their home and look after their children for a certain fixed salary. Her wages, this domestic worker, contributed to the GDP of the nation. One day, the mistress of the house died, and the master of the house married the housekeeper. Upon becoming the wife, she, she ceased to receive a salary, and the nation's GDP dropped accordingly. <laughs> but she continued to do the same work as before, and now sex work was also added. Some areas that I have engaged with. The third aspect of my lecture. I began my career examining issues of adolescent sexuality, reproductive health, decision making, so-called commercial sex work, HIV AIDS. I later became interested in domestic violence and popular culture. The subject of women's health in Africa, particularly women's reproductive health, has been the focus of much research in both the social and biomedical sciences we have already seen the horrific maternal mortality data. However, two major problems can be identified in the traditional disciplines. One, the studies insufficiently linked issues such as high maternal mortality, teenage pregnancy, or HIV AIDS to the social context in which these occurred, such as poverty, treating them rather as problems to be fixed, making African sexualities pathological as if there was something wrong with the way Africans have sex and African women and men were problems. But neither pregnancy nor having sex is a problem per se. The second deficiency, as a result of studies of the, of the nature that I have described, an instrumental or developmentalist approach was taken, assuming that women's health would benefit from the trickle-down effect of modernization and democracy and such magic bullets as education, but it did not happen. The diversity of women and men's roles and experiences were ignored, and reproductive health was disconnected from discussions of sexuality, as if you can get pregnant or HIV positive without a sexual encounter. When sex entered the equation, again, it was a problem. My earliest work explored what has come to be known as teenage pregnancy. I noted that the language of the debates constructed it mainly as a health and moral problem, promoting a bad girl image and ignoring the boys or men who make the girls pregnant. My work sought to insert gender and indicates the emotional challenges and pressures associated with sexuality for both boys and girls. I also point to the challenges posed by different expectations for boys and girls. The paradox whereby gender norms expect girls to display little knowledge about sexual matters, 
In other words, good girls don't know such things. While boys who are permitted some sexual license and knowledge about sex are rarely provided with accurate information, counsel, or guidance on issues of sexuality. Young men who do not conform to the no norms of sexual supremacy are often ridiculed and their masculinity is brought into question, thus encouraging them into sex when they are not ready and into exploitative behaviors. Poverty also encourages sexual exchange and exploitation. In this vein, Mr. Chairman, I've examined what has sometimes been referred to as commercial sex, both among so-called sex workers as well as single women. Interesting scenarios emerge. In papers entitled Costs and Rewards, Exchange in Relationships, Experiences of Some Ghanaian Women that I published in 1997, and My Coco is Between My Legs, costs and rewards in relationships. I find that women negotiate relationships in terms of livelihoods and survival. And one sex worker that we spoke to said, my cocoa is between my legs because that is how I can take care of my children. They talk about livelihoods, but they also associate risk with factors such as love and the quality of the man with whom they have sex. Thus, significant relationships endorse more intimate forms such as kissing and touching of body parts, while commercial forms are more likely to include condom use and eschew any hint of intimacy. This work led me to look more closely at how specific gender tra traditions and the constructions of femininity and masculinity, such as behaviors that sanction polygyny, extramarital relations, and multiple partners for men, as well as the enormous work burdens that many women confront, have influenced women's sexual health, especially related to HIV AIDS. Before the International Conference on Population and Development held in Cairo in 1994, reproductive health policies in sub-Saharan Africa were linked to population policies and focused on lowering population growth, hence helping women to control their fertility. Along with other African gender scholars, I have criticized the objectification of women and the cultural hegemony that occurred when the population enterprise reached Africa. For example, influenced by the work of scholars like Dodu and Eze, I critically examined the de demographic concept of women's unmet need. In other words, women are getting pregnant because they are not using contraceptives. But people did not bother to find out whether the women were just foolish or perhaps their husbands wanted children and therefore they could not use contraceptives. This produces a paradox that was not explored. Research on women's experiences with and responses to HIV AIDS is a vast field. Women remain particularly vulnerable to infection and my work reveals that many women consider it hopeless to expect faithfulness from their partners and feel unable to negotiate the context of sexual interactions. The findings that many women are unable to refuse sex to non-monogamous partners and to insist or negotiate for condom use. Also problematic is the ABC, abstain, be faithful, and use a condom scenario. What if you abstain but you are raped? What if you are faithful, but your partner is not? What if you want to use a condom, but your partner refuses and accuses you of being unfaithful? This is compounded by the fact that many adult men actively seek younger partners who are perceived to be free of HIV. I also alert to the danger of the overemphasis on the role of adults to the neglect of potentially risky peer encounters. For example, among street children, rape is frequently used as an expression of power and where forced sex is paid for, even the victims do not perceive this as rape because after they have been raped, they are given money and they feel that it is an equal exchange. Although same-sex relationships in Africa have not formed a core area of empirical inquiry for me, I have paid it some attention. While much popular discourse insists that homosexuality in Africa is taboo and an African, there's a lot of research to show that it was present, albeit on the margins of society, tolerated, and at worst, ignored or denied. As has been documented by others, I found that same-sex intimacies are not constructed in a gay rights identity framework. They are also transient, changing over the life course. Traditionally, sexual matters were guided by discretion, for example, in frowning on public display of affection among couples, the young people call it PDA these days. Verbal innuendos, metaphors, proverbs were used to con inconsistent with politeness, and you did not discuss sexual matters 
or other people's sexual matters. According to Yanka, only eloquent speakers who mastered the rhetoric of indirectness were allowed to tacitly address matters of sexual transgression or marginality. Thus, few references to individuals' alternative sexualities, such as same sex, were discussed. So the term supi, for example, which describes adolescent girls' affectionate and sometimes sexual attachments to each other, was a term of discretion that reflected tolerance, if not acceptance, which was often transient. And in one study, I stumbled across a young woman who had a sexual relationship with another woman, but she did not consider it sexual because the other person was female, and she expected one day to get married to a man. Gender and identity politics. Research on decision-making between spouses domestic gender role arrangements, sexual and reproductive behaviors, gender-based violence, all point to the importance of gender identity politics, like the driver with his mate. Issues of appropriate femininities and masculinities or care. I have been interested in these identities as they relate to the socialization of children, masculinity, fatherhood, and interracial relationship. In my work among teenagers, I look at the issue of masculinity more concretely and examine what manhood meals means to young men. Among boys in some studies, when they are younger, together with their sisters, they fetch water, they take the rubbish out, they contribute to kitchen work. The minute they become adolescents, it's like a rite of passage out of domestic work. One boy that we spoke to, his argument was so sophisticated, it was scary. He said that, if his wife was found not to be doing domestic work, he will invite his mother-in-law to spend a weekend and he will wake up very early in the morning, go and fetch water, heat it for his mother-in-law, and it will be plain for his mother-in-law to see that her daughter is a very bad wife and she will train her and he would have to say no more. We were surprised <clears throat> that this could come from somebody in his early teens. In a 2008 article titled Race, Gender, and Global Love, Non-Ghanaian Wives, Insiders, or Outside in Ghana, that I wrote with Akosia Dakwa, we counterpoint the focus on sexual tourism, that is the focus of most of the work on interracial uh, sex and love in Africa, by looking at intimacies between couples. And we come to this from the notion of intersectionality. We bring together race, sex, gender, and class and highlight the ways in which black and white women in different parts of the world live as gendered beings. Whether they live in the global north or the global south affects the way that people see them, treat them, and their expectations of them as women. In other words, your genderedness is complex and it travels differently around the world. As such, in deploying race in discussions of intersectionality, it is important to take these into account. My work on gender-based violence in Africa has looked mainly at domestic violence, um, particularly what has happened in intimate relationships, assault on house helps and foster children by employers and guardians, and sexual violence, rape, incest, and so forth, and the role of the state in relation to violence. Gender politics enhances our understandings of men's rights to control women through, for example, the physical disciplining of women and girls in my work with Mansapra. For Ghana, we, that is Mansapra and myself, found that women use the term beating and disciplining interchangeably and accepted some level of beating as discipline that their husbands were entitled to. Given that not all behaviors that are claimed to be tradition or culture are actually part of our tradition, and given that African men are definitely not animals, we urge that a historical analysis should be used to investigate contemporary connections. We know, for example, that traditionally, while some disciplining of wives was accepted, where men were not expe expected to leave marks on the bodies of their wives. So new explanations are required for us to understand the extreme and harrowing violence that we see in our societies today. Some of this can be linked to the challenges posed to masculine identities as a result of economic restructuring and the resultant hardships. Also complicit on the flip side are notions of provider, 
the housewife, dependents, and other inherited colonial constructions that mark ideologies that are at odds with more complementary traditional rules. Popular culture. The UN recognized the power of people's power long ago when it first instituted the role of UN goodwill ambassadors. <coughs> the illustrious list includes Angeli Kijo, Don Cheadle, and Didier Drogba. What do these people have in common? They sing, they dance, they act, they play. They make people laugh and have fun. They share our hopes and beliefs about life, real life. Today, from Ghana to Tanzania and Egypt to South Africa, <clears throat> hip hop music and dance moves, hip life and Azuntu in Ghana, have in introduced a vibrant youth subculture that is both entertaining and political. We have found that young people use hip life and even Azuntu to make political statements. My interest in popular culture emerged from a collaborative multi-country project on pathways of women's empowerment, in which Awu Asiedu and I, in particular, looked at representations of women in popular music. Music, like other forms of popular art, is potent in terms of um, giving you an identity. It is also powerful in transmitting cultural and political expression. Our work examines the relationship between images and representations of women and men, and hence constructions of masculinities and femininities in selected songs and music videos. We also explore the sense of gender identity among taxi drivers and students in urban Ghana. Representations of women's bodies and sexualities in the media have a bearing on women's actual and potential status. It expresses norms around women's sexualities, their dress and what is expected of them. Young girls follow these and then they are blamed for indecent dressing by the same people who have put these images out there and have suggested that this is the way they want to see young women dressed. This causes confusion for our young people. The slide up there tells us <coughs> some of the comments that were made about the nature of women <clears throat> in one of the workshops that we held as a result of this project. Women were witches, they were unstable, they were unreliable, they were jealous, they were gossips. But on the positive side, they were seen as caring, and particularly when one was thinking of mothers, the comments were very positive. The, song, the songs that we looked at also re-inscribe gender power relations and underscore the importance of women being good girls in order to win their husbands. The husband becomes the prize if you are good. If you are a bad girl, you will not get a good husband or you might not get one at all. While men can play with sexualized women in their songs and music videos and can have multiple partners, in order to make it to the wife category or to sustain this position as a wife, a woman must be humble, submissive, and not sexually available. This mixed bag of messages is confusing for our young people to make sense of gender relations. In 2009, as part of a major effort to link research and advocacy, we held workshops with musicians and media persons and eventually launched a song competition with empowering songs. The winning song was produced into a music video. The other two have music CDs. And we find that music, as seen among the people who participated with us, the popular musicians, the members of the media, <clears throat> Everyone thinks that music is a powerful vehicle to change, to bring about some change in our societies. My student Abnachere has taken this work further and is taking the lead in examining the lives of women musicians in Ghana, especially their professional trajectories. This work then led me in other interesting directions, one being the perspectives of men of God on women and gender roles and the other being the ways in which young people have used popular music to express their politics and citizenship. Let me just speak to the former. In this case, Michael Ochrefo and myself examined the writings of some prominent men of God from the new independent churches. At one level, some of the discourse could be read as pro-woman, particularly in the call to greater responsibility and love from husbands. This is indeed a positive aspect as it does not let husbands off the hook in the marriage relationship and would seem to call for partnership. <clears throat> However, as one reads the perspectives on women's nature and her role in marriage and society, 
it is less clear that wives in particular and women in general would find the freedom from the captivity and oppression in today's gender systems. Let me say that the quotes there do not come from the, any of the three men whose pictures are on the slide. I have hidden the identity of those who have said this for their own safety and mine. But I think that we should be very concerned if so-called religious leaders tell women that you are not the first woman to be beaten by your husband, you will not be the last, go home and pray. Indeed, in many cases, the writings seem to reflect contemporary societies. In biblical parlance, we will say a worldly notion about women rather than a liberating one. But Chef and I feel that conversations among Christians from different traditions where we might jointly examine current socio-political data on women and men's social and cultural positioning would be the beginnings of a more nuanced voice from these men of God. And now to the last aspect, my work on masculinities briefly. I reserve a special place for this in the lecture because it is an emerging area in African gender studies. After decades of studies on African women and gender relations, in the 1990s, African masculinities came into focus. The notion of masculinities, rather than a single masculinity, signals a concern with the ways in which diverse men's lives intersect with configurations of power. Not all men are powerful, just as not all women are powerless. But the study of masculinities did not come without contestation, just as with gender itself. Some gender scholars, particularly women gender scholars, were not happy, feeling that it distracted from the more important issue of looking at women's lives. Stefan Misha, in his book, Making Men in Ghana, looks at Ghanaian masculinities in five areas, childhood as boys, through apprenticeship and education, in work and employment, in marriage and as elders. The notion of a dominant or ruling or hegemonic masculinity developed mainly in Western societies argues that while there are different forms, there's a dominant form of masculinity that carries the most privilege. In the African context, however, we should see this as more complicated as a result of ethnic and kinship ties, lineage structures, the importance of seniority, and the effects of colonialism. Work, leadership, marriage, fatherhood, and sexualities are something that I look at. Already alluded to, are women's traditional provisioning roles for their children and their lineages. Archbishop Sapong, in his landmark book on girls' nobility rights in Ashanti, describes how young girls on attaining maturity are given the tools for productivity. They are exhorted to ensure the sustenance of their children, husbands, and lineage members, never forgetting their responsibilities to all three. Women were not expected to be economically dependent on men. They were co-laborers. The colonial imposition of the so-called male provider has distorted this arrangement and placed unrealistic burdens on men as they struggle to provide in today's economic climate. In addition, notions of appropriate work for men have left some abused and ridiculed because they are doing so-called women's work. Aganjani's work on Mozambique notes how men degender themselves when they go into the public space to sell cooked food because cooked food is something that women should sell. In order to regender as men, <clears throat> when they go home, they become abusive to their partners. Some violence is a result of economic hardship. Leadership. Women and men lead differently. For now, because females are socialized, differently and into different roles from men, but that is changing. Often women are socialized collectively. They tend to be more collective in their approach to leadership, bringing this collective social wisdom into their civil life. Masculine styles of leadership, which dominate our public culture, on the other hand, tend to be more imperative for men not to be emotional and to use more authoritarian styles. Extensive work has been done on African male political leaders in our so-called democratic dispensation. And on balance, the verdict is not kind. They have been described as abusive, undemocratic, corrupt, and violent. But traditionally, male leadership was not so. Even though leaders were special, 
To qualify to be a leader, you had to be an elder, or what the Akans will refer to as an opinion. You had to be kind, generous, caring of the community, and wise. If leadership could return to this mold, the character of our political cultures might change. A more collective construction of leadership becomes possible in such a, a view, with various qualities called upon at different times in different spaces, including the skills of women, as was once used in our traditional societies. Marriage, fatherhood, and sexualities. And with that, I will come to conclude. Importance of marriage, sexual expression, and childbearing in African societies cannot be ignored, though not necessarily in that order. The implications of this differ for men and women. In a paper with Ochefo and Michael Pervera in 2009 titled, Phallic Competence, the Making of Men in Ghana, <clears throat> that relies on a sample of urban men, we suggest that men make associations between biological fatherhood and manhood as indicated by notions of phallic competence. And these have important implications for marital stability, remarriage, and extramarital relationships. Fatherhood is not just about the role of being a parent, but also tells the society that the man is sexually active and potent. Hence, infertility is about male identity, and in a strong way puts pressure on both partners to conceive, and in some cases, to produce male heirs. With same-sex encounters, what in modern parlance is referred to as homosexual or gay, we must recognize that this political identity did not exist in our traditional societies. And the politics of a gay movement or gay rights agenda may indeed be of Western origin. However, that some people of the same sex in Africa loved each other and practiced same-sex intimacies is not foreign or new, even though it may not necessarily have been accepted and often people did not talk about it. That men who have sex with men do not necessarily identify themselves as homosexuals or even are ambivalent about the term is clearly shown in the sexual life story of Kamau, a young Kenyan man. His relationships with other males began casually and almost inadvertently in secondary school and were nurtured through a relationship with an older married man next door, incidentally a pastor in his church. Various forms existed in traditional society. In Cameroon, stories are told of men who used sex with men to overpower other men and it was associated with witchcraft and the occult. Various forms also existed in an age-based pattern. And this has also been recorded across Southern and East Africa. The institution of boy wives for military men among the Azande was documented by Evans Pritchard. And this relationship, according to Pritchard among the Azende, was considered a marriage both legally and culturally. Sylvia Tamale from Uganda says that homosexuality or same-sex relationship has a long history in the Buganda monarchy. It was no secret to anyone that King Kabagapa Mwanga practiced homosexuality. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the driver and mate must cooperate, otherwise the trotro enterprise cannot work. Whether movement on, on the road, whether economics or general atmosphere within the trotro, driver and mate must work together. If everyone's concerns and needs are met and their skills developed and harnessed, we enjoy a healthier and more wholesome organization whether it's the family, the school, the university, the corporation, or our country. If we all practice do unto others, but we are human, and so we don't, and we need structures. Gender is socially constructed, and so it can be dismantled. We built it, we can unbuild it. As societies change, whether as a result of local or global social and political and economic circumstances, gender roles must adapt. Dismantling a structure that no longer serves the economic and social well-being of our people today must happen. It will mean discomfort for those who have to give up some of their privileges. How might we achieve this? Education is important because we know <clears throat> that education is an important indicator and vehicle for people to move upwards. 
Formal education is important, socialization in our homes. The socialization will improve our social consciousness, it will improve our attitudes. Justice VRAC Crabb, who was at the time the chairman of the Law Reform Commission, on one occasion said to me, and this was the circumstance, some of us who are members of the Domestic Violence Coalition have been invited to meet with members of parliament to explain to them more about the domestic violence bill at the time. We had a very useful interaction with the members of parliament. At the end of it, the good judge said to me, Akosuya, what you are doing is good, but you do not change people's hearts and minds with laws. It has to be socially done. I agreed with him, but laws also are important. But the good thing about the interaction on that day was that even though there were some aspects of the domestic violence bill that were not included in the law, such as marital rape, very quietly, some weeks later, the Law Reform Commission, headed by Justice VRAC Crabb, expunged an old colonial law from our books, which said that a husband could treat his wife and have sex with her anyhow and at any time. The good judge, having listened to her that day, I think benefited from the social interaction. <clears throat> because of the importance of education for social mobility, our governments must make sure that it is equitable, it is of high quality, and it is accessible. They must provide the kind of education that they will allow their own children to experience. Laws, no matter how good, are only as valuable as their implementation so that their impact can be felt. Justice delayed, they say, is justice denied. There are many good laws that our government has not implemented and many laws that are not being acted upon because we have not provided the systemic arrangements. The law must work, the courts must work, the police must work, and we must be able to trust them. We need public education so that people will know their rights and they can make use of these laws. Gender activists, we also need to use and to learn the system and the laws. We also need to learn to compromise more and to appear less strident. We need to hone our negotiation skills. After all, kitwe bienswa. The story is told of Hawa Ibrahim, a senior partner at a law firm in northern Nigeria. She had studied the theoretical foundations of Sharia law and was a member of the women for uh, women leading a Muslim law in, in Nigeria. She has worked on several cases to prevent death sentences for women who had been accused of adultery. She has 157 successful cases to date over the last decade. She tells a story where once she went to visit the senior imams in one state in northern Nigeria to try to persuade them about a particular case in the Sharia courts where a woman was to be sentenced to death. The men received her and invited her to sit down. She said to them, it is impossible for me, your daughter, to sit with you, the elders, and she prostrated herself before them. The older men were happy. They realized that this woman is not there to challenge them. Western feminists say that she abdicated on her position, but she succeeded. The men did not oppose her even though they did not say anything positive in public, and the woman was saved from death. Healthcare, maternal mortality, but health is a concern that affects women primarily, but all of our households, because women care for the sick. If the system is poor, women suffer the most. As with education, it is not acceptable that our governments can find money for huge projects and state officials, but ignore the needs of us citizens. It is not for lack of resources in our countries. It is for lack of commitment and accountability. We need to overhaul the systems to make them the kind that our leaders will be willing to send their wives and daughters to, to give birth. The schools where they will send their children. The NH NHIS in this country must be made to work. After all, every day we buy water, petrol, and toilet paper and contribute to it. Religious spaces need to be places where women as well as men, wives as well as husbands, can experience the grace of God and the freedom from bondage that Christ preached at the start of his ministry. 
The church also needs to be a place where women can express their spiritual giftings and use these for the buildings of the body. And finally, citizen pressure. The Fa-Manyame syndrome must end. We must speak and act out when things are wrong. We must hold our governments and leaders accountable. Many of us have done it under military rule and we are still alive. Yara, Yansa Sini, I thank you for your attention. We shall have a few presentations. The first from Old Girls of Every Girls Secondary School, 
you heard that, people so high in, in the brothelized way. Thank you very much, current students of Ebri Girls Senior High School. The next presentation is from the Faculty of Social Sciences. The next presentation is from the Ghana Institute of Literacy and Bible Translation Building. <laughs> Ladies with style and vision. Vision and style. Next, we have the Volta Hall presentation. Volta Hall. Thank you all very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there is no doubt that uh, we've been treated to an excellent lecture this evening, one that should make all of us very proud as a university. And on behalf of the University of Ghana, Professor Akushia Demakwampov, I'd like to congratulate you on this excellent delivery. What I usually do after inaugural lectures is to talk about what I've learned. Today, there's so much that I have learned. The only thing I haven't quite learned is who was the driver and who was the mate. <laughs> it's something that, and it's the nature of gender politics that the Rules change with time, and the rules change with circumstance. That's how it is. So the person who is the driver today may become the mate tomorrow. And the mate, if he is dexterous enough, might become a driver eventually. That's how life is. We learn today about leftists and Christians. And we were told that usually they don't go together. But it's possible for leftists to be Christians and for Christians to be leftists. Indeed, in the audience, I can see a couple of uh, leftists, leftist Christians. I haven't mentioned names, but they know themselves. Do Africans do gender? And can Africans do gender? Professor Akushi Adman Kampofo tells us, yes, it's possible. And indeed, Africans do gender and have always done gender. Today, what academics have done is bring much more substance and structure to the way we study gender and understand gender. 
So that's a contribution that African academics have made. And we thank Akusu and her colleagues for that effort. We've learned a lot today about gender violence. Well, we knew always there was a lot of gender violence in our society. We haven't quite figured out what to do about it and how to deal with it appropriately in order to minimize or completely extinguish gender violence. So the fight continues. If there had been no gender violence, what we saw in Sabah Hall one and a half years ago probably would never have happened. But there is extreme gender violence in our society today, as there was seven years ago. What can we do about it? We learn about female husbands. That are the parts that are when we learned about them in other parts of Africa, but I did see female husbands in northern Ghana. There are female husbands, and now what we learn from that, clearly, rules, gender rules, do change and are affected by circumstances, affected by many different things. We learn about the contributions that gender studies have made to the humanities. That's a very important part of this discourse, an important part of what we have learned from the career of Professor Akushi Adumakwampofu, including acknowledging the significance and value of domestic workers. It's a very important part. Today, the rights of domestic workers have been captured in law in many parts of the world largely as a result of the work done by experts in this area. And then we learned quite a bit about reproductive health and the various specialties that are associated with that. We are the better in the world, largely because of what we appreciate and have come to appreciate from the work of various gender intellectuals, experts, and so on. There was a discussion of masculinities, and we learn about marriage, fatherhood, and sexualities. All of these should, together, help enrich us and make us better persons and institutions. So how do we change things? There was a long list of things that we could do as a society. For me, most important was education, formal education, she said. So what can we do as a university? What can we do as the University of Ghana to contribute to bringing about change in the way men and women relate, in the way governments and women relate, in the way women and women relate, in the way men and men relate? There are things we can learn. And I took a cue from your interaction with uh, Justice VCRAC Crab. So he listened to you and he changed something. He changed the law. I've listened to you and I'm going to change something in this university. <laughs> we do have in this university an anti-sexual harassment committee. And the function of that committee is basically to help us do away with all forms of sexual harassment whether from lecturers, or from students, from staff of the university. We do have it. In the last two years, the chairman of the committee has always written to me complaining about the lack of a budget. So having listened to you, I'm going to create a budget for the anti-sexual. I thank you for the contribution you've made and I thank all those who made it possible for us to get here today. I saw the valuable contribution that your family made in your education. I saw all the different professors that contributed to making you who you have become. And I'm sure they are very proud of what they have achieved in you. As I listen to the, your classmates from Abrigals sing, I was wondering whether that song was not that familiar from another school. <laughs> I'm sure they know what I'm talking about. Yes. 
So we are very happy that Abrigos has produced a very astute academic, an academic who has achieved all there is to achieve as an academic. As I watched the younger students still in the school come and do their presentation, I thought to myself, maybe five, six, seven of them one day will become professors in this university. <laughs> so we are very proud of you. And as I watched the families and friends and colleagues bring various presents, uh, flowers to present to her, I was wondering, how come nobody gave me anything when I did my inaugural? <laughs> but it shows that times have changed. Times have changed. So today, we do show appreciation for coming this far. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. I'd like to acknowledge a few individuals and groups here. Of course, we've seen the 96-year group, Ebri Girls, but if you are there, just show us by 1976. Nineteen seventy-six year group. Ebri Girls. Also in our midst, we have a former headmistress, Mrs. Joyce Asibe. <laughs> Auntie Joyce received an honorary degree from the University of Ghana some time ago. Also Mrs. Bampo, who is the current headmistress of the Jesus. We have the Calvary Baptist Church Teshi. And some students from the SOS Heman Gemina International. I'd also like to acknowledge our foremost nonagenarian emeritus professor, J.H. Kwabna in KTA. Three of our former vice chancellors are here. Prof. Akisoya is here. Prof, you're welcome. <laughs> Professor Ivan Adai Mensa. <laughs> and Professor Clifford Tegu. <laughs> I see in the crowd a former Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs, Professor Kwesi Yanka. I wasn't planning to make another speech. I simply wanted to make uh, two more acknowledgements of people here. We have in our midst today the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town, Dr. Max Price. Dr. Price is a member of the University of Ghana Council and so attended today's council meeting. And I also see in our midst the Pro Vice Chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Professor Peter Donko. Thank you.